This one is expensive, more than 20,000 RMB. This one is 2,800 RMB. This one is 2,200 RMB. This one is also 2,200 RMB. I adore Mongolian horseback saddles. In present day Inner Mongolia, whether in agricultural or pastoral areas, cars, tractors and motorcycles can be seen everywhere. Riding horses is not necessary anymore. These stirrups are pure white steel. What's the lowest price? Okay, 100 RMB lower. 2,000 RMB. Just 100 RMB? Baotub's home is in Horchin Left Middle Banner, Tongliao City, Inner Mongolia, 100 kilometers away from Hantia Gung Shop in Tongliao City. Going that far, Baotub only does so because he wants to buy a desirable saddle. You were south of the bus station before, right? Right. East. East, right? I had to make a detour to find this place. Take care. Small though it may be, Hantia Gung shop sells handmade horse saddles made using techniques which have been passed on within Han's family for generations. They have a reputation in Tongliao city. Craftsmanship is generally inherited within the family. Three generations of my family were in this field. People often say, I favor these kinds of saddles, as they're totally reliable and not too expensive. If you try selling this one for 1,000 RMB, there'll be someone else willing to pay 2,000 RMB for it. This process consumes lots of timber. This is carved from a complete piece of timber, so it's very light and looks very nice. The entire saddle is one complete piece of timber. Raw material like this is hard to find. When Master Hai He makes saddles, he uses timber from locally grown elm trees, which tend to have long growing periods and feature hard textures. The crotches and the branches of the elm are the best parts for making the front and rear beams of a saddle. Use elm and willow to make saddles. Make the front beam with a crotch part and make the rear beam with an elbow shaped branch. Now, I have about 30 tree crotches to make saddles. Some include branches. Some still need further processing. The timber for making the rear beam should have a larger angle than the timber used in the front beam. From a Mongolian perspective, a man's most valuable possession is his saddle, while women typically feel partial towards their head decorations. In the grasslands, horse races are held monthly. Organizers don't make money from them, but rather spend money on them. 
Organizers are usually well-off villagers who spend their own money inviting judges and offering financial incentives. They derive great satisfaction from these undertakings. Participants are lured from the neighboring counties, with some of them driving up to 100 kilometers specifically to attend these events. My horse has won three times this year. We came in first place twice already. Twice you won first prize? Indeed, last time we didn't prepare well, though we came in sixth. Mongolian saddles from different regions boast different shapes and decorative styles. The basic structure of the saddle remains all the same, however. A saddle consists of front and rear beams, pommel and cantle and retainer plates. Each part has a certain curve, even a retainer plate looks very straight. It's also curved to fit a horseback. How proper these curves are is where a saddle maker's skills can be seen. Rub it well, like this. Here is the front. The front should be thicker, the rear should be thinner. Do it until it's about 80% done. Then further processing will be easier. This one is almost done. Today, Many people when making saddles prefer planing machines to cut them and the use of a lathe to grind out a shape. Master Hiher, however, retains the use of his late grandfather's plane to cut at his saddles little by little. After preliminary cutting and processing, the saddle needs to be dried. This matters because drying guarantees that saddles are crack resistant and deformity averse. Dry cow dung emits heat constantly, causing the timber to be completely dry in 36 hours. Put this cover here. If the quantity is small, we will use this small stove. If the quantity is large, then we'll use the big stove. It takes 60 hours to dehydrate a wet tree, while almost 40 to 50 hours to dehydrate a dry tree. A saddle with a narrow seat like this is for lassoing horses. This is because it fits with mechanic laws governing how people employ a horse's momentum to lasso. This part supports the horseman, and the horseman can employ a horse's momentum. The pommel and cantle are convenient to hold, so this saddle is very narrow, while a leisure saddle is very wide. It's like a comfortable sofa. The birth of the saddle came about when horses were used as weapons of war. When stirrups didn't exist, people rode horses without any riding gear by merely grabbing at the reins or a horse's mane, clinging at a horse's ribs with their legs. Horsemen typically tied easily when they rode at a gallop, 
Harder still was to shoot arrows off a galloping horse. The emergence of saddles with high pommels and cantles prevented horsemen from backward and forward falls and provided needed stability in the form of saddles and stirrups. Horsemen could now shoot arrows in every direction comfortably while still riding. Who invented the saddle? A Mongolian or somebody else? One thing is for certain, Mongolians were the first to domesticate wild horses. They are the horseback people. At first, a saddle was without stirrups. Mongolians were the first in the world to use stirrups. In the 13th century, Mongolian tribes lived in the northern part of China. Introduced by Genghis Khan and preserved by his successors, Mongolian cavalry units were different from other kinds of military units. They broke with the mold of traditional European military tactics and helped with the founding of the largest empire in the world. In the pastoral areas of Mongolia today, horses are mainly used for transportation, but horse transportation has mostly been phased out in the rest of the world with the passing of time. So why do the herders of Inner Mongolia still keep around horses despite having access to cars, tractors and motorcycles? This is because a horse, in the eyes of many Mongolians, is considered an additional member of the family. They are more than just farm animals. Mongolians attach great importance to the idea of family. Family stories are featured a lot in folk songs. For many Mongolians, horses are treated as family members. I have three racing horses. Two of them are galloping horses. The last is a trotting horse. What about their saddles? Each horse has a saddle. This one is about three or four thousand RMB. How much the three in total? Almost 10,000 RMB. Why do you spend so much money on horses? I love horses. Saddle prices are insignificant. The dry rough back will be further processed. The back part should be like this. We need to improve it later. So we should save some room for it. It's like this. Master Hyher's tools were mostly left to him by his grandfather and they've been in continuous usage for more than a century. This kit is the head of the Bowang banner given to my grandfather for keeping tools. It is made of leather a kind of very expensive leather back then. We need to put it in the right position before we use it. Eighty years ago, saddles made by Haiher's grandfather enjoyed great popularity amongst the herders, who called them Gala Dachi saddles. For many herders, the Gala Dachi saddle was synonymous with quality. 
Paiher's grandfather was the first to make a name for himself. His saddles were not only exquisite, but also durable. More importantly, they didn't cause saddle wounds. Saddle wounds are what you get when you irritate a horse's skin with an ill-conceived saddle. The Gala Dachi name was taken from the name of the Gala Dachi township in Horchin Left Back Banner. At first, however, Haiho's grandfather hadn't been living here for the purpose of making saddles. He was forced to move here. He lived in this banner then, which is now referred to as Sagantaba village, Buta County, after the 18th of September 1931. This village was occupied by Japan. Haihe's grandfather then became famous for making saddles. Bao Shanyi, the then Japanese appointed banner leader, organized a military expedition. They went to the village, allegedly, to buy saddles. But in actuality, they just looted them instead. Bao lived among the local residents. He would rape women, kill and eat livestock raised by the local people. He upset the peace. Some of the old villagers thus persuaded Haihe's grandfather to leave. Because of this, Alatanok wanted his son to avoid the saddle-making business. But luckily, after they moved to Galadachi, they were free from harassment. After the village was liberated from Japanese rule, Haiho's father, Nonai Jabu, set up a saddle-making group, teaching members the skill and craft of making saddles. When I was working at a supply and marketing cooperative, the price of each saddle was 28 RMB. At 28 RMB, the saddle sold very well, because everyone rode horses. People living in adjacent regions all came here to buy their saddles. Even people from Xinjiang, Tibet, Tulumbia, and Jilin province, people living around here, all bought their saddles from here. Every month, every year, many people made saddles. This is the key. This was left by my grandfather. This is to measure the front part. This is for the rear part. The length is measured from the rear part of the horse. This is taken from measuring the front beam of the saddle. This is the back part. This mold was invented by Haihe's grandfather after several attempts and modifications and is perfectly adapted to the body shape of a Mongolian horse. All of Haihe's saddles are adapted from this mold to adjust for correct angles. The two retainer plates need to be perfectly parallel to make sure that when galloping with a heavy load, the horse's backs won't be injured. Put this on top. And have a look. Then draw the lines. The stirrups used by the common people are very different from those used by the rich. They are different in design. This one's called the Seven Eyes Dragon Head Saddle. There is a tinkle ball in the mouth of the dragon. 
Why this design? When the horse gallops and the wind blows, it will give off a whistling sound. Why is this one called the official saddle? It's because of the ball in the dragon's mouth. The other reason is that here are two dragons, according to the Chinese bureaucratic system. The seventh eye represents the owner in the second pin or the third pin. This means great happiness and longevity. Five Chinese characters for happiness are contained in the pattern. Wang Dianhe, a retired soldier, retired from the army in 1977. Wang kept the saddle from his beloved warhorse. This was the beginning of his saddle collection. Today, Wang owns more than 500 pairs of saddles. The saddles in this shop are only a small part of his collection. Many more have been rented out to museums and classy restaurants. Look, this is shark skin. Why is it covered in shark skin? Because it's highly abrasive material, usually talku or lama, taking his medical equipment, visited patients at their homes on horseback with this kind of saddle. The travel distance could be many hundreds of kilometers, so this kind of saddle was always chosen. It's priced between 500 to 600,000 RMB. I don't think I will sell this one. If the beam determines the quality of a saddle, then adornments and doe saddles with different characters and styles. The saying, affordable house, unaffordable saddle, mostly refers to the expensiveness of a saddle's decoration. This one is about 180 years old. A saddle with a small pommel plate is used by a princess. This one is called cloisonne enamel and requires a very complicated technique. First, paste the metal wires and then put enamel on them. After the motif is finished, color it with coral, pearl and diamond. Leaves and flowers have different colors. They match each other. This small fender is hand sewn. The flower is made from horse skin. Look at this motif. This is a peony lotus seed and peony. This is elaborately decorated too. Not as dignified and luxurious as those collectibles, the saddles made by Bata exemplify durability and usefulness and they are popular among herders too. Bata's reputation was built with his unique bronze saddle. The mold used for making this is the melting stove. From making the mold to building the stove, Bata finishes everything by himself. The stirrups at that time were four parts welded together. Sometimes they were not sturdy enough. Sometimes they'd break. I decided to change things up. In 2008, now this stirrup has become an integral one. The stirrup supply cannot keep up with demand with so many orders at least 200 pairs each year. Murin has four horses, all are racing horses. When we interviewed Murin, the horse standing behind him was like a naughty kid. He pushed Murin to leave quickly. Murin is very proud. He has won prizes from horse races. 
This is made by a batter, the saddle and decorations. Who made the decorations? Those are made by batter's brother. In our pastoral area, we use milk tea to soak leather. This requires two people. One person cannot support the weight. Barter started learning carpentry from the age of 12. He was once a shepherd and a movie projectionist. After it's finished, it's not ruffled at all. All is flat. Thus, your skills are superb. until 1989. Before that, I used to punch holes by hand. With the development of science, we can now use power-driven machines to punch holes. Machines make many things much easier and increase productivity. In the past, there was no such thing as bronze plates. We melted the bronze, and after melting it, we got a bronze block. We then hammered it. After hammering it, it would be a plate. Here is a new bronze plate, ready-made for further processing. Now we can make more than 200 plates per day. But in the past, only a dozen or so was possible. Barter is shrewd and smart. Apart from enjoying the convenience brought by machines, he still keeps lots of handmade elements in his products. He believes people favor a craftsman's human touch and wisdom over sterile machining.
The blue, the front and rear beams leave it to dry for 24 hours. I don't need to bother others. And we have everything we need in life. For example, making a rake or sharpening a knife. He doesn't have any difficulties doing those. That's why I married him. <laughs> An old Mongolian saying goes, a horse saddle is worthy of a horse. That said, who would be so silly as to give away his saddle just for a horse? A herder loves his horses like he loves his own life. If you place a shoddy saddle on a good horse, before too long, the horse will most surely get hurt. So a herder would never use a shoddy saddle. Help me hold this. Take this nail. You know? Barta has keen insight into the market. He makes full use of the convenience brought by machines. He has increased productivity to keep up with demand. Hai Ho's persistence in sticking with handmade saddles is more for the glory of his family. Compared with both these two men, Han Dawei's work repairing saddles is driven by his rational thinking. We are a very big research group. They are postgraduate students from the university. They are saddle repair majors. We have a Mongolian arts and crafts research center. We have lost many saddles. Some saddles have left the country. Many saddles have been bought by private collectors. We have already lost many patterns. They can't be found anymore. Take this deer horn decoration. It can be softened. After being softened, it becomes very mealy. Then it becomes possible to engrave it on a saddle. Later, after drying, it will be very strong. These skills, to my knowledge, have been lost already. The exquisite iron and silver damascening can't be seen anymore. Silverware still exists, but it is not as exquisite as it was in the past. Next, we will find a skilled silversmith, an experienced cobbler, to revive our cherished patterns. Peng Da Wei and his research group's work is dedicated to reviving this craft. Unfortunately, many old handicrafts are facing extinction through neglect. Generations of craftsmen have used their hands to exemplify outstanding achievements. Craftwork was characterized by nobility, exquisiteness, and elegance. Perhaps only everyday handicrafts will live on. When a piece of living culture can only be preserved in a museum or be bought at a high price as a collectible, this trade, this craft, will have drifted away from us as a living practice. <laughs>